<laughs> yeah, they must all be short here. I'm not, I'm not short. Whoa, that's better. Lovely. You know, it, it really surprises me that when you read through the Gospels, the amount of distance that Jesus and his disciples actually traveled. You know, and it, it's one of the things that struck me reading this in Mark. And then you go back a bit and you find out where he was, and you go back a bit further and you find out where he was. And in Mark 7, Jesus is up by Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon. And then in the next few verses, you find he's walked all the way down and he's come down to the Decapolis, which is on the eastern side of Galilee, about halfway down Galilee. Got nothing on here and both, of us. And then you find he's got in a boat after feeding the 4,000, somewhere around about here, at the Decapolis, the 4,000 appeared here, and he's gone across <coughs> to Dalmanthua, and there the Pharisees want a sign from Jesus to say who he was. And I think Jesus got a bit fed up with them, really. Because it says he didn't, he says you're not going to get a sign. Mm -hmm. And he gets back in the boat and he goes to Bethsaida. Now we've been to Bethsaida before because that's where the feeding of the 5,000 happened. And so they knew him and we're going to pick it up in Mark chapter 8 and verse 22. Says, and they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people. But they looked like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he was sent to his home, and Jesus said to him, Do not even enter the village. Anything strike you when you read the Bible that you've been reading for many, many, many years? When they came to see Bethsaida, it says, some people. Who are these people? do not even say they were his friends. do not say they were his relatives. We don't know who they were. It just says they were some people. I'm going to have to give you a hand, Held. Is that all right? Sorry, we're getting a little bit of... I'm humming, am I? You are humming, yeah. Just going to turn you off. Let me turn you. Yeah. Just pull that off. It's a hearing aid playing up, is it? <laughs> there you go. Testing, testing. There we go. Some people. Do you belong to that category? Are you some people? <clears throat> These people probably remembered the feeding of the 5,000. And they had this friend who couldn't see. And they took him to the one place where they knew he would get help. Now, this man is interesting. The first thing that Jesus does is he spits at you. 
It didn't go. <laughs> Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. When you cut your finger, what's the first thing you do? You say, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. You stick it in your mouth. Why? Saliva has healing properties, so the internet tells me. It's very good for controlling the flow of blood, and it's very good when you have a wound. Now, I suspect that this man had had eye injury because a bit later on, when Jesus has spat on his face and put saliva in his eyes, he says, I see trees like men walking. If he had been blind from birth, he wouldn't have known what trees look like. And you wouldn't have known what men look like. You see, the fact is, when you come to Jesus, Jesus knows exactly what's the best thing for you. And the best thing for this man was a bit of di divine spit. I see men. I see they're walking about, they look like trees. You must have known what men and trees look like. Jesus knew what he needed. And when you come to Jesus, Jesus knows exactly what you need. Actually, I don't think this man needed it, thought he needed someone to spit in his face. But Jesus knew what he needed, and it invariably. What you think you need is what Jesus doesn't think you need it, but he does know what you really need. Jesus laid his hands on his eyes, and his eyes were opened. The good news says, that he was able to look intently. What was the first thing he seen, saw when his eyes were opened? He looked straight into the face of Jesus. And then the Bible says he could see clearly. Whether that's physical sight or whether that is spiritual sight, we don't know, but I guess it was both. I guess once you have looked into the face of Jesus, things become clear. And this man had looked into the face of Jesus. You know, this man had a real problem. And some people knew where that problem could be dealt with. We've all got friends, we've all got relatives, and most of them have got problems. And the answer to this world's problem is Jesus. And when we come to him and we can look into his face, what does the hymn say? And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his wonder and grace. You know, there's a, a chapter in Corinthians that was read at the final assembly every time I went to school. So for five years, three times a year, we sat through 1 Corinthians 13. And it says at the end, now I see clearly. When you come to Jesus, 
Let's, let's just find it in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. One day we will come face to face with our Saviour. Now I know in part. But then I shall know fully, even, even as I have been fully known. Jesus already knows you fully. There's no getting away from that. He knows you better than you know yourself. You know, the Bible says that he even knows the motives behind your thoughts. That gets a bit frightening sometimes. I don't even think I want people to know my thoughts, let alone know what I'm thinking of. But this man was the epitome of that. Once he saw dimly, then he saw clearly. And Jesus was teaching his disciples as he's walking along that this is what the future holds. This is who he is. Actually, I don't think they understood it because half of them, when they were in the boat crossing over, they were arguing because they'd all forgotten to buy a loaf of bread. A bit difficult to get out of a boat and go to Morrison's. And then we carry on. Let's have the next slide. We go on from Bethsaida, we go back up to Caesarea Philippi. Now that's a trek and a half. That's about 25 to 30 miles. Caesarea Philippi is an interesting place. It was named after and in honor of Caesar. And it was basically a, a Roman, uh, Roman town where they worshipped other gods. If we have the next slide, we come to the springs that are one of the sources of the Jordan. And when Jesus gets there, he looks at uh, the caves and the grotto, and this is a hand place. Once you get up to Caesarea Philippi, you would have had the temples that all the Roman gods worshipped. And where the spring comes out, and there's a cave, and they would Baal worship there. And in the rocks, you can see niches, and they would have had their uh, little effigies to their particular gods. And this one was the god of Pan. Now, Pan is the god of fright. Who in their right minds would want to worship someone that was the god of fright? You know, when the angels come to people, what's the first thing they say to them? Don't be afraid. And the Romans had a god that worshipped fright. Sometimes you can't credit all people's sense, can you? But today, the word pan, actually we translated it into panic. It's where it comes from. What did Jesus they say about God? Perfect love casts out fear. One of the things this world is, if nothing else at the moment, is fearful about what is going to happen next. Most of the world in the East, where Jesus was brought up, is in a right state of panic. Why? 
because basically they're living without Jesus. And Jesus comes into your life. The problems don't go away. It's a bit like if you are going through a tunnel and the light at the other end has been turned off. So there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Jesus is in your life. He's in the tunnel with you. And then there is no need to fear, even if you think the light at the end of the tunnel is gone. We used to sing a song. Jesus is the answer to my every need. He hasn't changed. Probably we have, but Jesus hasn't. Jesus can't. God can't change. Do you know why? We measure time by change. If God changed, he wouldn't, he would be limited by time, and he isn't. And you can imagine that Jesus, when he comes into and he's walking around, the next slide shows it a bit closer. <clears throat> you can see the niches. We stood there watching the trout once in that pool. And you can just imagine when Jesus walked in there with his 12 disciples and they're looking at all these little effigies of gods and pan and goodness knows what else. And then he says, who do you say I am? Who do you say that I am? Am I just one of these things, little effigies that people worship? Just as a, a throwaway line, why do they call them idols? The answer is because they don't do anything, they're idle. Why does one of the Ten Commandments say, don't worship anything that you've made? Worship the Creator that made you instead. And he says to his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they go through a big list. John the Baptist come back to life. Elijah <laughs> come back to life. And then he gets down to the nitty gritty. What about you? What about you? What do you really think about me? Peter. The one who puts his mouth into action before his brain is normally in gear comes up with one of the unbelievable statements. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Putting it into Hebrew, you are the Messiah. Of the Son of the Living Lord. Rock, I am going to build my church. Jesus, Peter was the one that stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached, and 3,000 people came into the kingdom of God. Oh, I shudder to think what would happen if 3,000, I mean, it would, would be a right. But if 3,000 people suddenly rolled up in here, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? Billy Graham was the closest we've ever seen him. And he's, he's preaching, and all of a sudden he stops and he says, if you want to come, come. Whoosh. 3,000 people came into the kingdom that day because of what preached saying the Holy Spirit had got hold of Peter that day.
and he wasn't the impetuous Peter that we've seen before. He was the one that the Holy Spirit had got hold of and he preached. And today the church is still built on the rock of Jesus Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. Because if he isn't, I don't know what you lot are all doing here this morning. <laughs> you know, people say, oh, this, that, and the other. The advice to them would be, try Jesus out. Because if it don't work, what's the point? But the answer is, he is the son of the living God, and he does what he says he does. He wants to come, and he wants to transform lives, so that one day, as we've already heard, in my father's house are many mansions, or rooms, or places, and that is our eternal destiny once we get hold of the fact that Peter got hold of, that Jesus Christ, you are the son of the living God. You're not like all these other gods that people worship that can't do anything for you. You can open the eyes of people that are blind. You can feed multitudes with a boy's lunch. No, he said, if you really want to have an exciting picnic, take Jesus along with you. We, wherever we go, Jesus is with us. And there are people out there that need Jesus. They need to come face to face with him. And maybe all it needs is some people to bring, may not even be a friend, a neighbour or an acquaintance to Jesus. And we can leave the rest to him because he knows what we need. May we be those people that know people out there that really need Jesus and that we can bring him to them and them to him. You know, sometimes it's the hardest thing to make the first step to people. You know, they don't really want to come to church. They don't like it. We have to go to them and to bring them face to face with Jesus. It may not be in a church building. You know, I have a friend that uh, he will quite openly talk about it, but he won't come to church. I told him he's allergic to churches. But he still needs to come face to face with Jesus. And we need to be those some people that will affect the lives of people who desperately, desperately need to come face to face with our Lord and Saviour. Times are troubling. I don't think... <coughs> This world will stay as it is for much longer. But whatever happens, our Father God is in control. And we need to remember that and to be those some people for those around us. Father, I just pray that as we go into the future, you will just lead us to the people that you are calling to yourself <coughs> in Jesus' name. Thank you, Kevin.
end of that token. Um, we're going to have a bit more work shit now, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I thought I said earlier, let's just take a bit of time to think about what has been brought this morning to, to weigh it, to see what it is that God is saying to us. Let's not walk out of here this morning and be struggling to remember all the things that were said. Let's just take a, um, take a few seconds to do that. I 
What a story. What a reality to live. My sins are gone. My soul penny for as far as the east is from the west. Jesus, we're free. We are the free people. We no longer have shame. We are no longer a charge of sin against our name. All that is wrong, all that we have done, all that we're guilty of is fruitful. It's gone. We are free. Lord, we have such, such cause to give thanks. We praise you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, if you just uh, sit for the next uh, minute or so, and then that's something I really want us to do. Because um, thank, you, thank you, Penny. Wonderful. Um, I asked uh, Penn to preach on that passage, but it's just, it's such a beautiful twinning of those two parts. But, a man who couldn't see, and the disciple who can see spiritually. What I didn't realise is how much of a stomping and good job he was going to do with it. Well done, Ken, thank you so much. I wonder 